Our special guest today is the chairman of the Boeing Company. Uh, he has an extraordinary back background in philanthropy and in business, and let me just describe it briefly. Um, he served for 10 years as the CEO and chairman of Boeing. He just stepped down on July 1 after 10 years as the chairman and CEO. During that 10-year period of time, the market capitalization of the Boeing Company, the earnings of the Boeing Company, and the revenue of the Boeing Company uh, just about doubled. Today, Boeing is a company with about $100 billion market capitalization, about $91 billion of revenue, and about $6 billion in net income, has about 165,000 employees, and is our nation's largest exporter. Jim came to that position in 2005 um, from a position where he previously served as the CEO of 3M. He was the CEO of 3M from 2001 to 2005. He came to the position as the CEO of 3M from his position at GE. He was at GE for 19 years, 1982 to 1991, and served in a number of uh, positions at GE as the head of their electrical distribution business, as the head of their Asia Pacific business, as the head of their GE lighting business, and as the head of their aircraft um, engines business. Uh, in that capacity, he had a reputation as a very, very strong business leader, and he showed that obviously at 3M and at, uh, and at uh, Boeing. Prior to joining uh, the uh, GE, he was an employee of the McKinsey, and he worked before that at Procter & Gamble. He is a graduate of the Harvard Business School, graduate of Yale, and at Yale, he was a player on the baseball team as well as on the hockey team. He's a graduate of New Trier High in Chicago. He has a very extensive career outside of his corporate CEO positions. In the corporate world, he has served as the chairman of the Business Roundtable, as the chairman of the Business Council, and as uh, the chairman of the President's Export Council. In the, uh, he's also a member of the IBM board and the Procter & Gamble board. In the nonprofit area, he also has an extensive uh, career. He is the chairman of uh, a number of organizations on the outside, but let me just remember, uh, men mention a few that he's involved with. He's a member of CSIS, uh, the Center for Strategic and International Studies. He's a member of the Northwestern University Board and a member of the Northwestern uh, Memorial Hospital System, health system. He's also, uh, I'm glad, glad to say, a member of the Board of Trustees of the Kennedy Center. Uh, which the president just recently appointed him to. Um, in, in all of his capacities as a philanthropist, as a business person, and as a leader of large companies, he's done an extraordinary job, widely recognized by his peers as one of the leading CEOs uh, in the United States, and has received that title as leading CEO or CEO of the year from many different publications. In fact, this year, um, CEO Magazine named him as CEO of the year. So we're very pleased to have Jim McNerney here as our special guest today. Jim? David, thank you for that very gracious introduction. And before you go anywhere, I want to have a little fun with David. Okay. Uh, David, um, uh, I'd like to make a small or maybe not so small announcement. We'll, we'll see how it goes. But uh, you all know David and his role as a pillar in our nation's capital in many respects as a business leader, the largest and most successful private equity capital company in the world, philanthropy. In, the, in his leadership in many not-for-profit and other kinds of organizations. Uh, but look, uh, we, we at Boeing have supported the Kennedy Center, and, we, and we've been very proud to do it, David. And your leadership there has made a huge difference. And I think uh, uh, beyond bringing Deborah Rutter here uh, as uh, the new executive director, uh, the huge expansion plans you now have underway, uh, what I'd like to do is just hijack this moment and perhaps soften up the interview a little right, bit right. in so doing. <laughs> we'd, we'd like to announce a $20 million gift from the Boeing Company to the Kennedy Center. Deborah, would you please come up here and join us? Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to say anything? Or you... Oh. Um, 
Jim, obviously I want to thank you for this extraordinary example of patriotic philanthropy, giving to the Kennedy Center. Um, <laughs> we have a building program, as people know, we're going to make some additions to the Kennedy Center, and uh, this will be a great help in doing that. And I want to thank you for your agreeing to serve as a member of the board and for your work in helping to underwrite our most uh, well-known program, which is our Kennedy Center Honors Program. So um, I had some very tough questions, but... Uh, <laughs> Like, Here, I, David, yeah, I've, I've got, got some I've other got questions. You. Okay. <laughs> so I, uh, for all the people whose names I mentioned who are going to be future guests, I hope this is a precedent. But thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Deborah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All the best. Yeah. Okay, so I don't think I can top that. But uh, <laughs> thank you very much for that. I, I wish all of our board members were quite as generous, but thank you. <laughs> So let me ask you one question I've always wondered about Boeing at the beginning. When you have all these planes, are 707, 737, 747, why does everything have a 7 in it? Where does that come from? Well, you know, you have to under understand the mind of an engineer, okay? okay? And, the, and the mind of an engineer puts everything in categories, and they stay in categories forever. And uh, back in the late 40s and early 50s when Boeing was diversifying into all kinds of different aerospace technology. There was threes and fours for prop airplanes. Five and six category was for rockets and, uh, and satellites. And seven, uh, which is lucky in some cultures and unlucky in others, which is why we used three digits, seven something seven, to sort of mitigate, capture but mitigate the, the, the jinx factor, and so all jet airplanes were sevens. Now, at, you know, we're at the 787 now, so right. we, you, know, we, you know, it's gonna be a challenge, but those same engineers are gonna come up with some right. other category, I guarantee you. Okay, well let me talk about something that uh, I know you're interested in, because you, you spent a lot of time in Washington, I've seen you in Washington in, in, in recent months, uh, the Export-Import Bank. Mm. Um, Boeing is, I think, said to be the biggest beneficiary of the Export-Import Bank, um, first, why do you think we should reauthorize the Export-Import Bank? Well, uh, this, this is a very important subject for this, this country uh, to get right. I mean, just as background, and I hope I don't bore everybody to tears here, but the, uh, it is a very critical issue. You know, the Export-Import Bank really is part of a, 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 a treaty that's 80 years old between us and the uh, developed world. I think there's about uh, 60 other countries. And what we all agree to do is we agree to have, sort of have a level playing field for sovereign credit. So countries that don't have the same values that we do who might otherwise subsidize and create an unlevel playing field have agreed on how we're gonna price credit and how we're gonna, uh, how we're gonna price. And, and the, the philosophy there is it's backstop credit for the developing world uh, to help create jobs and support jobs in the, de in the developed world. And it has been a wildly successful uh, program because what it does is it isolates the quality of the technology being sold and gets off the table all the shenanigans that people could do financially. And, uh, and this has supported uh, tremendous growth in the developing world uh, as well as growth at home. Matter of fact, Boeing depends on this. And, uh, you know, we've been a country, a company, I should say, over the last decade, while our competitor has set up shop in lots of different countries in the world, uh, we have kept our uh, jobs and our technology here, in part because uh, of this arrangement here. Uh, uh, but right now, as, as uh, the politicians have fun with this thing, uh, and the facts are that two-thirds of both uh, the House and the Senate, if the vote was today, veto-proof vote in favor. But all the politics uh, associated with the extremes of uh, both parties, particularly the Republican Party, is preventing this thing from be getting, right. getting to a vote. Which, uh, and so I, I'm beginning to question the strategy of making and designing everything in the United States. I mean, if there's not an export-import bank, we're, we're actively considering now uh, moving key pieces uh, of our company to other countries. Be well, and we never would have considered that before this craziness on XM. So when you talk to members of Congress and explain the benefits of it to our country, yeah. what do they say? Well, they, uh, the, the conversations are always cordial. 
Uh, they always say they understand. But what, what this is, David, is a triumph of ideology over uh, any, any description of pragmatism. I mean, this, this bank has been authorized uh, by every Republican and every Democrat for the better part of the last century. And why? Because it levels the playing field on a global basis. It supports American jobs and technology. Uh, and people, uh, one, one part of the political spectrum calls it you know, cronyism for big companies only. Every time a 777 lands in Beijing, it takes seven or 8,000 small businesses to Beijing that are part of this big system with four million right. parts that we put together that otherwise would not be able to export. Well, some, some of the opponents crazy. would say that Boeing is the biggest beneficiary. When you yeah. look at who gets the most benefits, you're number one. Um, so, and they say Boeing is a big wealthy company. So is that in fact true that you are the biggest beneficiary? I, I think by, by dollars, yes. But I think in terms of deals, there are more deals for small and medium-sized companies than big companies, and not even making the point that 70% of the value added of our airplanes are made up by small companies who are making things for us, giving them right. to us, and trusting us to integrate them, and then exporting. None of those would have a chance to export without us. So if the legislation doesn't pass, yeah. you are thinking of moving jobs offshore? Well, we'd be for it. We love uh, making and designing airplanes in the United States. It's the best workforce. Uh, it has the best uh, educational system to underpin a very highly qualified workforce, as you can imagine. It has, uh, compared to many countries, a very business-friendly environment. It doesn't always appear that way. But we are now forced to think about uh, doing it differently. And, and I'm, you know, I'm a little bit wrong, uh, sort of wrong-footed by this whole thing, because my strategy has been a build in US, engage the American worker, export, that's why we're the, right. the country's largest exporter, and I'm beginning to think maybe I made the wrong decision. So, um, okay, um, <laughs> what do you think will happen with this legislation? I think, uh, listen, uh, I, I am more worried about it today than I ever have been, David, to be frank with you. I, I have always had a view that sanity would prevail on an issue of pragmatism. It's a sign of the dysfunctionality in this town now, where a, literally a veto-proof majority in both sides of the Hill, clear, I mean, the Senate has voted twice on procedural votes that are essentially votes on XM, 63 to 27, 67 to 22. Uh, we think there's at least 300 votes in the House. I mean, it's silliness, and, uh, and right now, uh, the leadership of both parties are walking around on eggshells, and it's, it's harming the country. And not passing this legislation, not reauthorizing the Import-Export Bank, which should be a free throw. This should not be, this is not a three-point shot. This is a layup in terms of what's right for the country and what's right for the well-being of the workforce, keeping technology onshore, retaining our uh, leadership in aerospace, it's, uh, and I'm speaking, and I, I can speak, I think I can speak for my friend Jeff Immelt at GE. Uh, he's, he's having the same business reviews that I'm having right, right now, which is, okay, prior plan, build everything in the U.S. and export. What's the new plan, guys? We got to think about this. I mean, uh, maybe there's export credit somewhere else. Okay, let me ask you about Boeing uh, specifically. Um, who is Mr. Boeing? Is there a Mr. Boeing, and uh, <laughs> yeah. does his family still have involvement? Or well, you know, it's interesting. His uh, his son just recently died, and I spent some time with him. He was 93. Uh, we had a picture of Boeing's first airplane next to a Dreamliner with the two of us standing there. We both signed it. Uh, but but Bill Boeing, uh, his father, uh, founded the company in 19. Uh, 16. We're on our hundredth year right now, and it, uh, it's, uh, and 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 the first engineer was a Chinese citizen, as it is, wow. which is, is very interesting. I had the, I had the, uh, uh, Yang Jiangxi, the the John Kerry of China, at at my office the other day, and we were, reminiscing about uh, hands across the sea and. But it's. Um, so he was based in Seattle. Is that why it was originally? Yes. Yeah. He well, the the, the chief engineer. Yeah. Bill Boeing was based in Seattle. Seattle. He was a timber man. Went to Yale. Came back. Went to an air show, and there weren't very many air shows back in 1915. Came back all excited, and had all this money because it came from a successful family. And he decided, 
let's get into this, this exciting thing. Right. And so we started delivering the mail for the U.S. government and, uh, right. and off to the races. So let's go back to how you came to Boeing. You um, were famously um, at GE, and Jack Welsh, who was then the CE, set up a system that maybe others haven't emulated, which is to uh, have yeah. three people publicly identified as yeah, the potential yeah. next CEO. Um, you have picked a new CEO yourself recently. Did you consider a method like that? And what do you think of that method of picking a CEO? Well, every situation is different, and you have to adapt. I think in the case of the way Jack did it, uh, highly decentralized company. None of us were ever in the same room because we were running, running out. All the places you named I ran were right. in Hartford, Connecticut, Cincinnati, Ohio, you know, Hong Kong. And so, we, and so he, he had a very Darwinian approach to this thing, which is, hey, guys, let's see how good you are. Go for right. it. You know? And that's one way. And with a management-rich company like GE, you can do that. And he said to the other, he said, two of you guys aren't going to be here. So, you know, and so we all bumped into each other interviewing for jobs because it was right. all uncertain. You know? and, and, uh, so, uh, it right. was hysterical. And so I took a very different approach. And I think, uh, and, and as you pointed out, I, I've just appointed, a, uh, the board has just appointed a new C CEO. I, I remain chairman for a period of time. The, uh, we had a different approach. We had an early identification and then a work with me, side by side with me for a year and a half, not under me, more of a deputy. Because I, I think the, the, the difficult thing about being the chairman of a big, uh, CEO of a big company like Boeing is not all the stuff you read about in the business school, you know, not picking people right. and allocating resources and, and uh, the like, segmenting markets. It's sort of the emotional dimension of working the gray area, working outside, inside, uh, sort of trying to figure out this town, which clearly I haven't yet, based on my earlier discussion. And, and so, you know, it's, and so he lived with me for a year and a half, and, and quite frankly, that worked for us. Very different kind of place. So when Jeff Immelt was selected, you, all the headhunters called you up, yeah. and you had a lot of different jobs, I know. You took the 3M job. How come you took that job as opposed to some of the others I know you were considering? I think, I, think uh, uh, I, I like the Midwest. I'm a mid Midwesterner, but I think what I like most about 3M was Highly diversified, even more diversified than GE, even though it was a smaller company. 35 different divisions, uh, each one uh, with a different set of customers and technologies right. and uh, factories and global position. And so I, I like the intellectual challenge of managing all these things. And of course, you had to find centralized, centralizing principles and decentralizing. So uh, when you were announced as the new CEO, yeah. the stock yeah. went up 16% just on the announcement. So it was hard to live up to that. Yeah, I mean, you, you always get more credit than you deserve, and that's a perfect case, and you always get more blame than you deserve. So just accept that. So you joined the Boeing board while you were at 3M, and then yes. one day Boeing needed a CEO, and you're running at 3M, and so was it awkward to leave 3M and go to Boeing? Yeah, I mean, I think, listen, I, I think, uh, I don't think it's a secret, Boeing approached me a couple of times. I felt that I, I had an obligation at 3M for at least five years. And so I, I got to the end of that obligation. And at the same time, it was very clear that if I didn't say yes this time to Boeing, that it, it wasn't going to come around again. And so it was balancing an obligation to a company and, and 70,000 people that I'd committed to and, and getting that company going. And so, so when you joined Boeing, everything was working smoothly? There were no problems? Is that right? <laughs> no, it was very interesting. Uh, no, we, we'd, we'd hit a rough spot. Uh, both uh, on a business basis and, and we had some ethical challenges that we were dealing with. And uh, so we really had to create a new culture. And I, and I would say that was the biggest challenge right. and the most fun at Boeing, which is, and we, it was complicated by the fact it was Boeing, McDonnell Douglas, Rockwell Hughes, and we were trying to put this all together and we made a lot of acquisitions. So the choice was one of those cultures or a new one. I chose new one. So let's all define a new right. place. And, uh, all the things attended to that. So the decision to move from Seattle, was that before you came? or Just before. Just before. Just, so just they, before. Why yeah. did they decide that Seattle wasn't good enough for Boeing at that well, point? Well, it's kind of like, why is Canberra the uh, capital of Australia? And it, it, because it can't be Sydney or Melbourne, okay? okay. So it was kind of the same deal. Couldn't be St. Louis, McDonnell Douglas. Couldn't be Southern California, Hughes and Rockwell. Couldn't be Seattle because we weren't being ecumenical. So. We had to find a neutral site. And what were the other cities that you uh, I considered? Think that I think about Denver, and uh, I think D.C. was was thought about, and, uh, and Atlanta. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, 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 and Dallas, Dallas, you're right. right. You right. have better memory than I do. 
And that's because we had two major, that was sort of customer driven. So you wanted a place that began with a D, Dallas, Denver, DC, but you picked Chose Chicago. Chose the C. Okay. Yeah. C came so, before D. So, um, <laughs> so speaking of Ds, um, somebody named the uh, plane the Dreamliner. Um, yeah. So I don't know who came up with that name. Was that somebody in your organization? Yes, it, it was. It was the team out in Seattle. It's actually. A, it was a great. It was a great name. And, and okay, so we had never. We had never done that. We'd never sort of branded with a name one of our airplanes, and it was a great move. Before we get to that, all right. The 707. That was the the first in the seven series. And that there's no more 707s that are uh, being made. But you have. They're still. Oh, they're still flying. flying but flying. there's no. They stopped making them uh, a couple decades ago. Okay, then the 727. Yes. And they are not being made anymore. Nope. All right, the 737s, you still make Still them? being made, the most, uh, most prolific airplane of all time. And then the 747, and as I understand it, when that plane was so big that it was designed by engineers, when it went down the runway for the first time for test flights, they weren't sure if it was actually gonna take off. Well, let's put it this way. The, when they lined up all the test pilots and asked for volunteers, they'd already they'd figured out the 10 guys that were gonna step back and the right. two that weren't <laughs> gonna know about it. <laughs> and so, so, but that plane became the most profitable plane up until the Dreamliner of all time because you, met, you sold, I don't know, 1,000 of them? We sold about 1,500, 1,500, 1,500 747s at this And stage. how many people buy them for just their own personal use? Are there a lot of those? <laughs> David, we can help you. No, no, yeah. no. no. <laughs> uh, no, we got, I'd say, uh, I'd say there's probably 30 747s really? that are what we call VIP, uh, concentrated in the Middle East, and there's probably uh, as many Dreamliners. Really? Are, yeah. So, the, and then the 757, and the 767, Seven. that's... And then we backfilled, when we bought McDonnell Douglas, there was something called the MD-95 right. that we rebranded the 717. Okay. We, we, we felt horrible we'd left the 717 right. category right. behind it, so. So um, when people go on a, on a plane, it's a Boeing plane, and they say the seats might not be wide enough, that's not your fault because you don't design the seats necessarily. That the airline that decides how big people's rear ends yes. are. Yes, yes, yeah, and it's a combination of our customers deciding how big their rear ends are and the air, and the airlines deciding how many people. And the rear ends in. have gotten wider they, over the slightly, slightly. slightly. So. Talk about the 787. So what was so novel about it um, that it required you to do all the kind of things you did that you had never done before? To well, I think the, um, the story of the, seven, uh, the 787, the Dreamliner, is, you know, over the last two decades, I'd say, uh, you could sell a new airplane with a 5 6 or 7% improvement in economics. It would pay out over a long period of time. But that was enough. The Dreamliner... Uh, made a huge jump to 20% uh, fuel efficiency and 30% maintenance cost, which are the two biggest costs that an airline has. So it was a huge jump, and it was driven by a composite fuselage, which is stronger but much lighter. You can carry a bigger pressure differential between the inside of the cabin and the outside, so you're flying at an effective lower altitude. The dings that you get on aluminum, you don't get on composite. That relates to the maintenance cost. It's uh, in an all-electric kind of control surface. Uh, you're using electricity to move the control surfaces around, so you don't have heavy pneumatics, and, and uh, uh, the redundancy is cheaper. And so there's, but the, the basic driver is, is composite, the choice of composite. But it took itself. longer to build than you thought. Yes. And yes. so you were under some pressure, I guess, to get it built. And yeah, it was, we spent uh, twice as much as we'd originally thought we would. Fortunately, it, it, was, it was a wildly successful airplane from a marketing standpoint. If this had not been a popular airplane, we sold three times as many as we budgeted, even though the budget right. went up two times. That's the story. So your back order now is, you have eight years of back orders for that? Eight years of back orders, which is too long. Sorry. But we got 300 uh, Dreamliners flying. They've flown about 60 million miles total now. Everything's going Right. Well, there was a problem, I think, for a while. You had some electrical... I don't you... remember anything oh. about that. Okay. Okay. Um, I have some issues I don't like to remember either. We had, but, we uh... had a... No, it's true. We had, we had a, a, a battery issue, lithium-ion right. battery, uh, manufacturing control, and a bit of a design issue that we had to get under control. And it was... Uh, uh, you know, one of the misperceptions was because there was smoke venting that it was uh, a safety of flight issue, which it never was a safety of flight issue. But it's, uh, 
but it's, uh, it was something that the flying pub public was very concerned about, uh, that the FAA was very right. concerned about. We had to get it fixed, and it was a shame, it was a shame on us, but the good news is we got fixed it fixed. It. Yeah. Okay, so today, um, you are not just in the commercial aircraft business. You make uh, defense uh, aircraft as well, and what is your principal activity now in the defense area? Well, I, I would say uh, it's pretty evenly distributed, but fighters, transports, helicopters, uh, for example, the Chinook and the Apache helicopters, uh, satellites, I think we're selling more satellites than anybody right now, launch vehicles to get the satellites uh, into orbit. Uh, we're working on the uh, rocket that will go to Mars and beyond now. We'll be testing in, uh, in uh, 2018. Uh, so we're working on a, and, and then a lot of what you would call cybersecurity, autonomous vehicle, right. and then black programs that uh, support our government. So you didn't mention your competitor. Uh, you mentioned you had a competitor, but I don't know if you want to mention their name, but uh, it's basically two companies that produce yeah. commercial aircraft. Why do you think there's only two in the world? Will there likely be a Chinese one at some point? Or? Well, yes. I mean, I think there are two in the world that I think relates to the scale of uh, the infrastructure needed to design and build these things and then support them. When, you know, when, when we sell someone an airplane, 40% uh, or 20% of the life cycle cost is the initial 150 million they spend for the airplane. The remaining 80% is support we provide over the next 20 years. So there's a big scale. And, uh, but I think uh, Airbus and, I, and us will face competition. And I, if I had to bet, it would be China. They're a little farther ahead on building a 737 A320 competitor. Uh, the first one may not be perfect, but the second one will be there. And so I think it'll be at least a three-man right. game. In the 1960s, a plane was developed called the Concorde and supersonic, mm -hmm. and people thought it was nice. They only made about 13 of them or so. Yeah. But now we have no supersonic planes. Uh, why is Boeing not developing one? Or maybe you are. Well, we, we are, but it's mostly for, for defense and, and space. But for, for commercial application, which is your question, uh, it, it, the, the business equation just never worked. I mean, the, uh, we could, you know, the, the Concorde carried, what was it, the 105 passengers right. or something. Uh, uh, it cost 3x a first class ticket. And yeah, you got there in three and a half hours as opposed to seven. That equation just didn't work. I mean, not enough people were willing to spend that amount of money to save that amount right. of time. And so it's, uh, we can, just an interesting aside, if I could jump in. Uh, just before 9-11 happened, we were on our way to develop a sonic cruiser as sort of the next airplane. And think about it as taking the same technologies I mentioned on the Dreamliner, but deploying them toward performance, speed, uh, and uh, less concerned about fuel, less concerned about range, less concerned about economics for the airline, just a race car, okay? 9-11 happened. We had to completely change our view because People didn't want to go through security lines anymore, and the security lines were getting tough. Uh, the, so you needed a long-range aircraft that flew slower, but uh, flew over security lines point to point, not point to hub to another right. hub to point. Uh, fuel uh, tripled in price, so fuel efficiency was more important. So using the lightness of the airplane, not for performance, but for fuel efficiency. So we, in the course of 18 months, completely, we were headed toward a supersonic airplane, and we changed overnight in 2002, and in 2004 we introduced a completely yeah. different airplane. So we're always asking that question, I guess is the point. And after 9-11, you had to change, I guess, the doors for the cockpit, so now you have yeah. like steel-plated doors or something, it's pretty difficult to get in there if you're not a pilot? Yes, and, and, and it, of course, which became the source of the issue in Germany. Right. So, I mean, it's... You know, it's hard for human beings to plan every exigency, but I think, uh, I think there's some workarounds there that uh, requiring two people in the cockpit at all times. I think there's a combination of the hardened door and two people will get us to where we need to be. So on the planes today, they're supposed to be fairly automatic and I obviously trained pilots, but if you're not trained like me, I'm not trained, if I went into the cockpit and tried to fly something, what, what would happen? Well, I think... <laughs> It, it was nice knowing you, David. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I think I think if there was if there was a pilot sitting next to you, even without with his his or her hands off the control, you could fly the airplane. Uh, it would be more difficult if uh, you were up there all by yourself, listening to someone telling you how to fly right. the airplane. 
But the, the uh, flying a plane now is so, it's such an integrated system that uh, relatively simple movements of hands and feet, and even your eyes now with heads up displays, uh, can fly the airplane. Uh, take, off, take off and particularly landing is still tough though. So for Boeing going forward, what do you see as the biggest challenge for the company? Well, I think uh, the immediate challenge over the next decade, because we have this huge backlog, is successfully and profitably building it out. And uh, that centers on the 787. Uh, I think the uh, other challenge is whatever the redefinition of the defense and space business will be, uh, because we, for, for whatever reason, uh, the US government is not, and it's well chronicled and well described, but the, it, it has traded off other things right. uh, uh, against defense, spending less, sequestration. Uh, I don't think the threat environment has changed at all out there. So I think at some point that is gonna true up and what that all looks like. And so we're trying to keep balance, uh, getting our costs down in defense and space with still investing enough to be ready for the next upturn. So that's, that's a big challenge. And two commercial aircraft areas I'd yeah. like to ask you about. You don't really have corporate, you have Boeing business jet, but you don't yeah. have a, like a Gulfstream kind no. of thing. The no. reason you chose not to get in that business is? Uh, I think competitive dynamics. I mean, our, our two choices were business jets and regional jets. Regional jets has, have, uh, there's a number of government entities that subsidize people, and we just don't want to be in that game. Uh, the business jet, it's a pretty competitive world right now, overcapacity, and so, we'll, we'll, and we have very attractive core markets. What we're in right now right. grows at 5.5% a year for the next 30 years. Why would I want, and right. I'm the number one guy, I think I want everybody in my team focused on winning there. So you're, you're one of the other areas you haven't been in, I guess, is there's a, your competitor has an A380, which has, yeah. I don't know, 600 people Big, in it or yes. something. You haven't built a competitor to that, and the reason is? Well, we, I think we read the market differently. I think, I think our competitor read a little more of a hub and spoke world where the A380 would go from hub to hub and other planes would go, would complete the uh, journey. We had a view that uh, more frequency, uh, avoiding hubs, point to point, uh, St. Louis to Guangzhou, as opposed to St. Louis to San Francisco to Tokyo right, to Guangzhou. Right. We had a view that, and that, that was the creation of the Dreamliner. So it was a different read of the market. So you have a lot of test pilots, I presume, and what do they tell you about the best way to avoid jet lag? <laughs> the, um, I haven't asked the test pilots because they, they actually have a pretty good life. You know, they, they can, you know, it's the crazy people like you and me. Right. right. And, and the only thing I've learned is just ignore it. Okay. Okay. So you've run a lot of companies. Now, what have you learned as a CEO or president of companies? What do you do differently today to be a leader of people? Um, and how do you lead 165,000 people? Yeah. Look, I think uh, someone asked me this question the other day, and uh, I think when I was younger, running divisions at GE, you know, I thought uh, intellect, decision making, uh, it was clear to me so everyone else would get it. Uh, I, uh, today, uh, I realize that's about 20% of leading an organization, that it's more about what culture you have and how it's defined and how it's clarified that really guide people uh, uh, to what they do in the dark. Uh, and alignment, how people see their role in an enterprise. I mean, we build these big things and, and the missions are exciting and the technology is exciting, but there's always a challenge when you have a program with 20,000 people working on it. You want every Jack and Kathy and Susan to feel really important. And so how that, that kind of alignment is communicated and the comp programs that align people. And so it's more about alignment and culture. Right. I'm much more that way now. And, and any old guy tends to end up there. When you say old, I'm actually, you are- um, <laughs> 11 days. 11 days- uh, Younger uh, than Younger you. than me. Yeah. <laughs> then, um, so why at, the, at what I regard as the teenage years, <laughs> did you decide to retire? Um, well, you're a relatively young person. You could have gone on to like Warren Buffett another 20 years. <laughs> yeah. Why did you decide to retire um, first? Two, re two reasons. One, look, it's a, uh, we have a very long cycle business. Decisions that people make today will have long tail risk for another 10 or 15 years. So I think it's very important that 
the person that's running the, the place have a long view of major decisions. Uh, uh, the person who replaced me, Dennis Mullenberg, just turned 51, all right? So uh, it's, I think it, he will make slightly different decisions knowing he'll be, he'll be around to catch his punt, okay? So there's that, that philosophy. The other, the other is that uh, I've been doing this for 16 years, and I think there's other things I'd like to do. Don't ask me exactly what those are, because I don't know. I'm trying one to figure of, that would out. Would one of them be going into government? That the president said, I'd like you to be a cabinet officer? Or? I have served as the president of the Export Council and some other things, and I am very gratified with that experience. That's enough. <laughs> OK, so you probably are not a candidate. I haven't. I, I, no one's called me. OK, well, I'm sure they, they might, yeah. given your number. I'm sure they will call. But, <laughs> yeah. um, so let me ask you, you grew up, grew up in Chicago, and um, you went to New Trier High School. And I guess uh, Sharon Rockefeller went to New Trier mm -hmm. here. And um, so you were a great athlete, I guess, in high school, recruited to play sports in college. Well, I wouldn't say a great athlete. I was a good enough athlete to then go play in college. That's okay. the way I describe it. But you it. played baseball on the same team as George W. Bush. Yes. Did you yes. think he was a better baseball player, or do you think he was more likely to be president of the United States? Well, he's he's uh, well. It was a hard call to make back then, but he obviously had potential for both then. Okay. But the uh, uh, but he obviously went further in politics than he did in baseball. I mean, if I if I could be pitching for the Yankees back then, I'd be pitching for the Yankees. Okay. But it's. Uh, now no, it was fun. He was, he was a fun guy to have on the team. Now you still play ice hockey. Yeah. And is that, is that safe a sport? Uh, yeah, well, the risk management is important. And <laughs> what I've learned is that uh, I play in a couple old men leagues. Young men, young, young men. Yeah, young men. <laughs> is to play with guys that, that played a lot when they were younger so they don't have anything to prove anymore. That's the key, you know. So uh, you have five children, and they're doing various things, but... Um, what, what, what advice do you give them about whether to go into business or go into nonprofit or government or? Well, uh, the advice I give them, particularly as they're starting out in their career, is to find some place that has bright young people on the run, okay, where people are hustling, where there's high standards, there's bright people. I don't care where it is. A couple of them come to this town to get into the, their staffers and they're working in the administration. Others found business. But I think that first 10 years, to find rat races with good people is the important thing. Uh, then the standards are set for life. Then you can go off and pursue your interests. That's sort of my view. So uh, you've seen a lot of great business leaders in your career. Are there a couple that you would say, this is a person I really uh, see as a role model as a business leader or as, a, as an investor or as a, as a motivator of people? I, th I think Welch is the best. I mean, you know, he's... Uh, uh, Even he's, though he didn't pick you to he succeed didn't, him. He did, did, didn't pick me. He's... Uh, he wasn't, I said he was the best, I didn't say he was perfect. The, no, Jack, he's, Jack will be turning, I believe, 80 uh, this November. He was an extraordinary guy, he truly was. I mean, he was uh, a people guy who would grab your heart and grab your mind, and yet he was tough, and things got done, and you wanted to be, you wanted to be around him. And I've, I've never seen anyone quite like that. So let me go back to the initial thing you talked about, uh, which is the Export-Import Bank. Yeah. Are you going to see members while you're in town, or you think it's not productive at this point? Well, no, no, no. Uh, I, I will see members while I'm in town. I've been talking to them on the phone routinely for the last 24 hours. I think, look, the state of play is that, the, that an overwhelmingly approved amendment, I think 67 to 26 roughly, uh, on to the highway bill in the Senate sent over to uh, the House. I, I don't think the House is going to act on it, which was our hope. Uh, we thought we had uh, the mechanisms in place for that to happen, and evidently we don't right now. And so it, this, uh, if it, nothing happens over the next week, we're still going to push. We're gonna, uh, then we're going to be dealing with it in September and October. Uh, during that period of time, I'm going to make very clear to anyone who wants to listen, whether it's a member or whether it's a friend like you, uh, exactly what it means for my company and other companies. I mean, if you had Jeff Immelt up here, he'd tell you exactly the same thing I'm telling you. And uh, there are consequences to this decision that, that, it, that I think people just playing politics, they don't, they're not connected to the real world anymore. All the money's on the extremes in politics, and all the debate is, uh, in many cases, more cases than I'd like to admit, is focused more on 
the money than it is on what's good for the country is, you know, when, uh, when the Constitution was framed, and you're the only guy I know who's probably got a copy of it, yeah. the, uh, <laughs> all the states were together, and about 67% of the states agreed on the Constitution, another third didn't. So a pragmatic decision was made, let's have a constitution. Uh, that kind of thinking doesn't happen right. anymore. You know, the, the, the way our country was founded led to pragmatic decision making and presumably, and, and the way it was stitched together by Madison and, and, uh, and uh, Alexander Hamilton uh, tended to take, uh, tend to guard individual freedoms and perspectives and yet bring them together right. to move the country forward. We don't have that anymore and it's very, very frustrating. So as you look back on your very distinguished career, what would you say has given you the greatest pleasure? I think, I think the people, I think the people involved with whatever I've been doing, I tend to be a, a people person. And so uh, my kicks in, in leading organizations is having the team around me, trying to figure right. it out together. And, and so it's the dinners afterwards <laughs> that right. are probably the most fun of my life. So on behalf of the uh, Economic Club of Washington, I want to thank you. And on behalf sure, of the Kennedy Center, I particularly want to thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I hope you have set a precedent for future speakers, as I mentioned. <laughs> but uh, thank you very much for everything you've done. David, thank, yeah, you right. thank you. Thank you. Thank you.